Hi everyone, my name is Maddie. I am a wildlife biologist who works for the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. Um, and the reason that you're watching this video today is because I was supposed to come and talk to your class about endangered species on Monday. But as you can see, I am home in my home office and I'm sure many of you are home and not at school, but we're still gonna have a really fun lecture and learn about endangered species anyway. Um, and I just want to remind everyone that just because you have to stay away from people um, and home from school doesn't mean that you can't get outside and enjoy some fresh air. You can go for a walk or go for a hike. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. So I am going to share my screen. All right. So I have cleverly. Uh, named this lesson the Virtual Endangered Species Lesson. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about who we are as an agency first, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we do. And part of what we do is help protect endangered species. So this is a slide that represents the duties of the Office of Kentucky Nature Preserves. Um, and to sum all of these up in a couple sentences, we buy and protect land. So we purchase natural areas, um, woods and fields, grasslands um, that don't have any development on it. And we protect that land for the wild animals that live there. Um, in addition to that, we collect data on all the animals and the plants that live there to better understand them and learn how we can manage their habitat better for them. Um, in addition to these properties, um, a lot of them are open to the public, meaning that you can go outside and go hiking on them and enjoy the wildlife just as much as we do. And there are also some properties that we can um, kayak and fish on too. So I mentioned those properties and here's a map that shows them all over the state. These are all of our properties or properties that we have involvement in. And no matter where you are in Kentucky, if you go to our website, you can find a hiking spot near you. If you wanna get outside, cause I know how it is to be stuck inside. <laughs> so here's some of the things we do as an agency. These are some pictures of us working outside doing land management. And land management is when we manipulate the habitat to make it the best possible home for the animals that live there. Um, and some of the ways we do that is by removing invasive species that kind of come into an area and take over everything um, and push out all the native species. Um, another thing that you could see in this bottom right corner, there's a, a fire, a prescribed fire. So a lot of our grassland habitats left here in Kentucky, um, they need help because right now there's nothing um, disturbing the grasslands to keep all the woody species, all the trees and stuff from growing in it. Um, so in order to keep it a grassland and not have it shaded out by all the trees, we put prescribed fire on the ground and it burns up all the grasses and it helps replenish it and make it grow better next year, but it also kills all the woody trees that we don't want in a grassland. So I mentioned that we take data on all the species that live in our wild areas. Um, here's some pictures of us doing that. We take aquatic data, we take um, data on bats, salamanders, plants, birds, bugs, um, and everything in between. Um, and if you look at that little caving picture, that's actually me. I'm crawling in a cave looking for um, some beetles and some endangered bats. With all that data that we collect, we put it in one area um, on our website for everyone to see and to help other land managers and researchers uh, make decisions about protecting wildlife too. And lastly, right before the, the lesson, we do environmental education and recreation. Um, so a lot of the stuff we do is super important, but it's equally as important to tell people about what we're doing and so that they know uh, which animals are endangered and what they can do to protect them and just make them want to learn about the natural world around us. Um, so that's one of my favorite things to do. Now let's talk about endangered species. So first we're just going to talk about endangered species in general. What are they and why should you care? So an endangered species is an animal or 
plant that is in danger of disappearing forever. If there's no more of its kind left in the world, it becomes extinct. Um, and I'm sure if you think of um, some endangered species right now, you might be able to name a couple off the top of your head. Um, some that we hear about a lot in the news or at zoos um, are elephants and tigers. Um, so down here I have a picture of a couple of endangered species. On the left, it's an Asian elephant. Um, there's a tiger in the middle. It's an Asian species of tiger that's endangered and then a yellow poison dart frog. So it means that there's not many left of them in the world and so they are in danger of being extinct, which is where that label comes from. <laughs> so what causes species to go extinct or become endangered? Habitat loss is the biggest factor. So we talked about habitat and where animals like to live. There's all different types of habitat. There's woodland, there's grasslands, there's oceans, there's streams and lakes and rivers. All of those areas are specific habitats for specific wildlife that live there. And so the biggest problem um, with species becoming endangered or going extinct is that we're destroying a lot of their habitat. Um, and it's not always us, a lot of it is humans. Um, there's habitat that gets destroyed by natural disasters, um, but a lot of it is driven by humans. So when we cut down forests and stuff like that. Another reason species are becoming endangered is exploitation. This is when there are not a lot, a lot of species left of a particular animal and people go out and hunt them or poach them um, and take them um, from the environment. And so a big problem that we see with that in the world today is elephants. It's a good example. And the ivory on their tusks, people um, illegally hunt elephants for ivory and try to make money that way. And um, hunting, I just want to make it clear that hunting is not bad. In Kentucky, we hunt, um, but it's regulated. There's a lot of science and research that goes into it, um, that there's plenty of uh, deer and turkey and stuff, and it's okay to hunt them. Um, exploitation and poaching is when um, animals are hunted or taken um, out of the environment when there's not a lot left of them um, and it's illegal to do so. Another example of something that happens in Kentucky, Kentucky is poaching of wild plants. A lot of our rare and wild uh, plants are beautiful and um, an orchid is a good example. And some people like to take that for themselves and rip them out of the ground and try to sell them. And that is also exploitation and causes species to go endangered or extinct. Invasive species, that's another um, driving factor in um, extinction is sometimes spe uh, species are introduced to a new area where they are not normally found. Um, these are usually called exotic species but not all exotic species are invasive. The invasive ones are the ones that kind of take over everything. They eat up all the resources, they take up all the space if it's a plant, and shade out all the other plants um, until there's nothing native left. And so that's a big problem. Um, and the last thing that is a driver um, in extinction is climate change and the seasonality of things. Um, so with climate change, the world is warming and seasons are happening at different times and it's affecting the way things are growing. Um, and as you know, in the food chain, plants are um, the first source of energy and food in the food chain. And so if things are growing at different times and animals are expecting it to grow a certain time and it's not growing till later, um, that can affect the, the species too and cause them um, to decline. So we are going to do a little simulation um, based on those four things that can cause extinction and endangerment um, with pandas, because <laughs> I thought it was the easiest thing to do. Um, so pandas are not affected by all four of those things necessarily, um, but for this um, simulation, they are going to be. So here we have uh, pandas in their specific habitat, which is a bamboo forest. Um, pandas can only live in this habitat uh, um, for the most part because they almost entirely rely on 
bamboo leaves um, and bamboo itself for food. So this is the habitat that the panda lives in. Um, and what happens with habitat destruction? Well, sometimes habitat is destroyed to create more room for farming and housing and buildings and just development in general for people. And so that is one way that pandas become endangered. The next thing is exploitation of the animal. So sometimes um, animals are taken for something of value um, illegally. And so that also gets rid of some of our pandas here in this simulation. Um, and then the other thing is climate change. So here, um, pandas actually um, migrate during the winters. And when they come back uh, in the summers, the bamboo is supposed to be growing and um, flourished and there should be a lot of it. But if the seasonality of bamboo growth is affected, then when the pandas come back and if they have nothing to eat, then that can cause some pandas to disappear too. Eventually, the animal becomes extinct. But we don't want that to happen. And conservationists, symbologists like myself, um, and all around the world are working together to tr try to prevent species from going extinct. And so I wanted to talk to you about um, endangered species that we have here in Kentucky. I know a lot of you hear about endangered species and you think of pandas or tigers or elephants, but we have endangered species right here in our backyard in Kentucky. Um, a couple of them are um, the globally rare Schwartz goldenrod. Uh, it only grows in one place in Kentucky. And it's this little flower right here. We have a federally threatened um, Kentucky arrowhead darter. Um, it's a fish and it's kind of in the southeast area of Kentucky. Um, and then we have a federally endangered bat called the Virginia big-eared bat. And a lot of these are endangered or rare or threatened because of some of the scenario or some of the um, extinction factors that we mentioned earlier. But there are many, 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 many more rare threatened and endangered species in Kentucky. Um, but these are just a few. And I guess I should clear that up. So there's a level of the way that we classify animals. Um, if there's, there used to be a whole lot of them, but there's not a lot anymore. Um, it's becoming rare because they're harder to find. There's not that many as, they, as there used to be. Um, after that, if they still start to decline, then they become threatened. Um, and when they're threatened, it's because they're on the threat of being endangered or ex extinct. Um, once it's threatened, and if they're still in decline, then they become endangered. Um, and that is when they are in danger of becoming extinct and there's really not a whole lot of them left in the world. Um, and then after that, unfortunately, if they still start to decline and then there is no more left of its kind, then it becomes extinct and it doesn't exist anymore. We don't want that to happen. <laughs> so what does happen if a species goes extinct? Um, in order to answer that question, I think there's a couple of concepts that we need to understand first, and that is what is an ecosystem. An ecosystem is living and non-living environmental components interacting as a system together. Um, so living and non-living things. We've got, you know, plants and animals, and then our non-living things are things like water, um, dead bark, and um, logs from trees, because trees are living, but um, when they die, their, their bark and their um, trunks still provide habitat, but they're not living anymore. Rocks um, and things like that. And so ecosystems can also be sometimes described as a web of life. And the reason they're called that is because if you take all the species of a habitat or in an ecosystem environment and you put them on a board, and you draw a line to each species of how they interact with each other, um, it creates a giant spider web looking thing because everything is connected. So we are going to um, look at an environment and you guys are gonna try to come up with ways of how these plants or animals interact with each other here in Kentucky. So here is our ecosystem, our little habitat here. Um, and I want you to look at it real hard and take a second to
to think about what could be living here? What could be in the trees? What could be in the log? What could be under the rocks? What could be living in the water? I'm going to give you guys a couple seconds to think of some stuff, and then we'll talk about it. All right, you got some ideas? Well, the first thing is um, this little ring neck snake. So all of these species that I'm going to show you here are species that we have in Kentucky. Um, so this is a little ring neck snake and it is hiding under the log for shelter and coverage from predators. It also likes to hide under there because ring neck snakes exclusively eat small insects and worms. Um, they're actually really, really tiny snakes and their mouths don't open wide enough to eat anything much bigger than that. Frogs. Frogs can be um, in the water, outside of the water, near it. Um, usually this time of year, if you go outside, you can hear them singing. We have the trees. The trees are part of the e ecosystem too. Um, these, this leaf that I have here in particular is a white oak tree. And oak trees um, deposit acorns. There's a white-tailed deer, um, which goes through, run, walks through the forest and uses it as coverage, um, but also to forage for food. Here's a red-eared slider. Um, it's a turtle that you can find basking on logs on the water, on rocks, um, trying to get some warmth from the sun. Um, this is a species of flower that we have in Kentucky and glades shoot primarily, um, but for this purpose it <laughs> exists in this habitat. Um, and here is a butterfly that we have in Kentucky that is pollinating and getting nectar um, from these flowers. We also have bird species that use the forest and the trees um, for nest building and egg laying and for coverage. And this is a Kentucky warbler. And then down here, this is a green salamander. Um, they really like limestone, so you can find them in cracks of rocks um, in eastern Kentucky. And then we have a little, I think it's a deer mouse, um, little mouse um, in the tall grass over there. We have a red bat, which these, this species of bat actually likes to roost in leaf litter. Um, so that means that they hide under the leaves of coverage. And we have a barn owl um, that also uses the trees um, and interacts with all of these species. So now we are going to show how all of those things interact, the living and the non-living things. So right now we have the water interacting with the turtle because it lives near and finds food in the water. Well, deer also drink water. So deer interact with water, which interacts with turtles. So they're connected and rely on each other in an ecosystem. Um, the deer also forages on young oak leaves um, and acorns that the white oak um, tree provides. The white oak tree also serves as coverage and habitat for nest building and egg laying for the Kentucky warbler. The Kentucky warbler um, and birds in general in Kentucky, we won't limit it to the species that are here um, on this map, but birds in general um, eat seeds and insects sometimes, and that includes butterflies. Um, butterflies like to pollinate lots of plants here in Kentucky and get nectar from them. Plants and flowers in Kentucky need water to survive. Frogs depend on the water to lay their eggs and reproduce and mate um, and get their food. Barn owls are predatory animals and they eat anything that they can find that's small, usually reptiles, amphibians, or mammals. Again, the barn owl can eat small mammals, including the deer mouse. The mouse uses the rock for shelter and coverage from predators. 
Snakes also use things like logs and rocks to hide under from predators. Snakes can also forage on forest floors and use leaf litter to conceal themselves. Um, we also have species of snakes that like to climb trees here in Kentucky. Again, um, bats, all bats, well not all bats, but many bats in Kentucky use trees to roost in. Um, there's some that we talked about that leave roost underneath the leaf litter, but there's also some that like to roost in trees that have died and become hollowed. And there's about a million more ways that all of these things interact with each other. So as you can see, we have just created a giant web, a web of life. Um, now I want you to imagine if we were, if all of these things, if this was rope and it was all connected to each other and we pulled one of these things out, like the deer, let's say the deer became extinct, what would that affect? Everything, because it's all connected. Um, so this is just a very good visualization of how everything is connected. Um, and if we want to protect the environment the best way that we can, we need to protect everything. Um, and so sometimes people don't think as endangered species as being a plant or a small frog or something like that. Everyone just thinks about the big animals that we call charismatic megafauna. And those are the pandas and the tigers and the elephants of the world. Um, and it's really good to care about them because um, we don't want them to go extinct either. But some of these smaller species that um, right here that we have in our backyard that a lot of you probably didn't even know about um, that are endangered or on the verge of becoming extinct, we should care about those too because if we lose that species, we don't know how it's gonna affect everything else in the ecosystem because everything is connected in this big web of life. So, what can you do to help endangered species? You can create more habitat. Um, for example, the monarch butterfly, um, it's threatened. I don't believe it's endangered yet, but um, it needs our help. It's running out of habitat. The monarch butterfly is super unique because it migrates all the way from North America to Mexico and back every year. It's crazy. Um, and in order to make that big migration, it needs to come down and stop and rest and get food and nectar. Um, and it's having trouble finding food and nectar because all the habitat is going away from development or farming or who knows what. So what you can do to create more habitat is plant a garden full of pollinator food. Um, and I can link some websites after this uh, to help you get started on your pollinator plant, but you can create little spots for butterflies and other pollinators to come and rest in nectar. You can recycle um, another habitat or another endangered um, factor that we didn't, I didn't cover, I should have covered, is pollution. If we think about our oceans um, and what ends up in there and how it's affecting species that live in it. Another thing you can do is educate your family and friends about what we talked about. Um, I'm sure they'll be surprised to know that we have a lot of endangered species here in Kentucky. Um, choose native instead of invasive species when you're planting a garden or you're decorating um, your house with um, buying tree saplings and stuff like that. We want to choose native species because what happens is if you plant an invasive tree in your house as a decoration, um, like I said, everything's connected. Birds will come and they'll eat the fruits of that or the seeds of that and they'll carry it somewhere else. And that's how invasive species spread and take over um, our native areas. And protect wildlife habitat. Do what you can to uh, help protect um, habitat that exists. Um, you can go outside, you can do trail cleanups, you can um, pick up trash and um, enjoy nature. And what one of the things that our agency does is protect wildlife habitat from development. So we go out and buy property. Not everyone has that um, ability, but that's something that we do um, to protect uh, wildlife species. So with that short lesson, I just want to say thank you. And if you have any questions, you can email me at naturepreserves at ky.gov. Bye.